everybody for coming to the Aaron Torres podcast YouTube page. If you could do me one quick favor, see that little black subscribe button on the bottom of your screen. Go ahead, hit that little black subscribe button. Really does help this channel grow, my audience grow, and I appreciate it more than you know. Also, quick thank you to our presenting sponsor, Betfred Sportsbook and the Betfred Sportsbook app. Bet $50 on any game. Get up to $1,111 in free bets courtesy of the Betfred Sportsbook. Thank you again. Now, here is the video that you came here for. But at the same time, there was a very important and interesting college football story that broke late Friday, or right after I finished recording Friday's Aaron Torres pod. It involved the Tennessee Volunteers, the Tennessee football program, and more importantly, the Tennessee football program under former head coach Jeremy Pruitt. Jeremy Pruitt, of course, was the head coach for, what, three, four years there at some point. I think he got hired in 2018, got fired in the winter of 2021. But I bring it up, you know, Tennessee's obviously been doing well under Josh Heupel, intrigued by them coming into this year, but they had not yet had a resolution on the NCAA investigation that had gone into Jeremy Pruitt's time as the Tennessee head coach. Well, on Friday, we did get that resolution to all of the crazy allegations and things that Jeremy Pruitt did. And what I want to do now is talk about what happened to Tennessee, what Jeremy Pruitt did, and all the craziness that happened around this punishment and this program over the last three or four years. But let me start by saying this. In terms of the punishment that Tennessee football got, Here's what you need to know. They will not have a postseason ban. I'm in favor of that. We'll explain why momentarily. They did get fined over $8 million, which the NCAA basically said, look, normally five years ago, he would have given you a two-year postseason ban. We're not going to do that. But $8 million is about what you would have made by playing in the 2023 and 2024 postseasons. So we are going to fine you that. Oh, by the way, there are going to be 28 scholarships reduced over the next five years. There is going to be limitations on when you can recruit, how much you can recruit, the players you can bring to campus for unofficial and official visits, et cetera. And then, oh, by the way, on top of that, there were individual punishments specifically for Jeremy Pruitt, who got a six-year show cause, basically meaning Jeremy Pruitt will not be coaching college football anytime soon, if ever again. And so those were the punishments for Tennessee football. I saw a lot of people say, oh, they got off light, no postseason ban. To which I would say, I don't think they got off light at all. Do I think it was a fair punishment? I do. Do I think it was a light or easy punishment? I do not. So let's get into it. Let's break it down. But let me start before I even get into what Tennessee was punished with. I want to get into what Tennessee was punished for. Because you talk about insanity across college football and just systematic cheating run amok. That is what Tennessee was under Jeremy Pruitt. Not saying Tennessee's a bad school. What I am saying is Jeremy Pruitt, boy, oh boy, oh boy. Boy, oh boy, oh boy, was there a lot going on. Remember, by the way, the Jeremy Pruitt case was the one that allegedly involved money in McDonald's bags. That didn't happen, but just about everything else did. So here is what the NCAA found out about Tennessee, okay? And before we get into what they did, there are two quick caveats that I want to mention prior to telling you what Tennessee did. One, we got to remember this was pre-NIL, okay? So the uh, the numbers and the dollar amounts that are going to be thrown around, they're not going to feel like a big deal. But one, it did still break the rules. And two, a lot of what they did, even in the NIL era, would break violations of the NCA protocols. So don't give me the, oh, everybody's getting paid, who cares? I know, wait till you hear what they have to say. And two, it is important to note that many of these things happened during COVID in 2020. It was obviously a different world. So here's what you need to know about what Tennessee did, okay? So first of all, in terms of Tennessee and what they did, a couple things stand out. One, as I said, systematic, and that word is not hyperbole, systematic cheating in terms of unofficial visits and getting kids on campus, okay? So remember, In college sports, there's two kinds of visits. There's the official visits in which the school pays for lodging, hotel, food, meals, travel, whatever. Unofficial visits are supposed to be paid for by the individual student athlete, the player, right? Um, And that's why you're limited to five official visits and you can take unlimited official visits, unofficial visits, because basically they're saying like, look, the school should only be on the hook for so many of these things. You can't just fly around the country taking 10, 20 official visits. Uh, We got to limit some of this stuff. Anyway, 
on those unofficial visits. Again, the player and his family are supposed to pay for it. Well, that was not the case at Tennessee at all, okay? So this is what happened at Tennessee, basically, when they would have unofficial visitors into town. They would call ahead to the hotel, make sure the room was set, then an assistant coach, a staffer, or whatever, would go down, pay for that room in cash. Restaurants would be called in advance. Hey, we got a party of four, party of six, party of eight coming in. We'll come back and settle that up later. Just go ahead and put it on our tab. We'll take care of it. They'd come back and settle it in cash. Obviously, it goes without saying, unofficial visits are not supposed to be paid for by the school, so you don't want to leave a paper trail. So Tennessee was had the, the hotels locked in, they had the restaurants locked in, and they went back and paid for it later. Here's the wild part, though. On top of all of that, the other part was this, is that they were purposely deceiving the school. This was the craziest part that I found out of all of this stuff, okay? So it's one thing. You pay for restaurants, food, hotels, whatever, in cash. Coach has been doing that since the beginning of time. It happens everywhere, whatever. Love it, hate it, whatever. I've never heard of this, though. Tennessee's recruiting staff was actually putting together two separate itineraries prior to all these unofficial visits. That way they could submit one to the school, to the compliance department, which oversees, make sure you're not breaking NCAA rules, that one would say, oh, yeah, John Smith gets in at 2 p.m., uh, you know, whatever. He paid for this. He paid for that. And then they had the second itinerary, which is what actually happened, where they were breaking all the rules. So that was one. The second major thing that they did, they had a bunch of recruits on campus during COVID. And if you remember during that time, and I know at this point it was a long time ago, but the NCA had about a five, six, seven, eight-month dead period in recruiting where you couldn't bring kids on campus. Now, we can agree or disagree now based on the facts that we have, but at the time, it wasn't deemed controversial. But basically what the NCA said was pretty straightforward. They basically said, like, look, here's the deal. End of day, end of story, like every state has slightly different rules on who can come in, who can come out, what the testing policies are, whatever. Again, it sounds dumb now, but in 2020, most did not deem it to be dumb. So the NCA just basically said, look, Nobody can have kids on campus at all at any point um, just to keep the, the playing field level, right? It's not fair if, say, Georgia's laws allow you to come on campus and hang out and do whatever and this and that. And then, you know, another school in another part of the country doesn't have kids on campus and you're not allowed to bring kids on campus. So the NCAA just said no recruiting visits at all under any circumstance. Again, just something Tennessee said, yeah, you know what, that's a rule, but we're not really going to abide by that. They had, I believe the number was nine players on campus at that point. Obviously, it goes without saying that all those players had their lodging, hotels, meals, et cetera, paid for, again, in violation of NCAA rules. And it's worth noting, and I remember saying this with Arizona State, which got busted for the same thing, uh, bringing in recruits during COVID. I just think it's dumb. I think it's dumb because at the time, everybody was playing by the same set of rules, right? So like, why, if you know Georgia can't bring in kids and you know Alabama can't bring in kids, and I, I know somebody will say, oh, they were obviously doing it and they just never got caught. But the bottom line remains is that like, there was no reason to bring kids on campus because nobody was visiting campuses anywhere. So just dumb, just idiotic, whatever. So we have the unofficial visits that are paid for, uh, fake itineraries. We have a, 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 you know a lot of kids coming to campus to visit during a COVID dead period. But I all know what you're thinking. I know society is full of Jeremy Pruitt defenders. And yes, I'm being sarcastic. I know Tennessee fans probably hate Jeremy Pruitt more than anybody. But the question becomes, well, what did Jeremy Pruitt actually know? It's the old, what could the coach have possibly known? He's busy putting together game plans. Well, as we found out, and I remember talking about this when the initial report came out a year ago of allegations, not only was Jeremy Pruitt actively involved with all of this, how about this? Jeremy Pruitt had his wife dropping bags to kids and their parents. Yes, another one that I have never heard of. I'm not saying I've never heard of a, uh, the head coach himself handing out a, a little cash here or there, helping a kid here or there, whatever. We can debate whether it's good or bad. I have never heard of a coach's wife dropping bags, only that's exactly what Jeremy Pruitt's wife was doing. Two instances the NCAA found. The first was a player. Kid came to campus. Jeremy Pruitt took care of the kid, took care of the kid's mom, 
six thousand dollars, which which helped pay for a car. Again, we can agree or disagree whether that's right or wrong, whether it even matters in the NIL era. What's interesting, though, is once the kid got to campus, you know who was dropping bags every month to make sure that the kid was taken care of and the kid's mom was taken care of? Ah, yeah, Jeremy Pruitt's wife. That's right. She was dropping $500 a month to the kid's mom to make sure the car got paid off. So how about Jeremy Pruitt's wife? The second one, by the way. Jeremy Pruitt gave $3,000 to a recruit and a recruit's mom for a medical procedure that needed to get done or to pay off bills so she could get another procedure. That medical procedure, by the way, was hip surgery. Jeremy Pruitt paid for a recruit's or a player's mom's hip surgery. Maybe you've heard of that. I know that I never have. Shout out Jeremy Pruitt. Who said chivalry's dead? That's right. So that is what happened at Tennessee. Um, And what's interesting was kind of sort of like how they got caught, okay? And so first of all, big credit to my buddy, uh, Trey Wallace, who now works for OutKick. He's been on this show a couple times. As good as anybody covering college football, he was the one that broke a lot of these details. But what was interesting was part of the reason that the punishment was quote unquote a little bit light was because Tennessee was so active in making sure that they brought all of these details to light. This all broke because somebody overheard the coaches talking about players getting paid, reported it to the school chancellor. The school chancellor then launches his own investigation or her own investigation. I don't know if it's a male or female chancellor. Beyond that, I found this very interesting. The director of compliance, again, compliance overseas, make sure you're playing by the NCAA rules. Director of compliance then went to hotels, restaurants, asked for receipts, asked for video surveillance footage. Are you like, like this story is insane. Maybe that's what all compliance directors do. I will be blunt. When I was in college, I actually did work in the compliance office. I've never heard of a compliance director or an assistant compliance director going to hotels, getting surveillance footage for schools in an NCA investigation. So obviously, because Tennessee was so proactive, because they fired Jeremy Pruitt, this is why they were hit with the punishment that they were. Again, if you remember, it was no postseason ban, uh, an $8 million fine, 28 scholarships taken away over the next five years. Although I'm a little confused because I believe they've already taken away some previously. And then, as I said, limitations on recruiting. 10 Saturdays over the next you know, five years. So two home games a year, you can't have official visitors. That's a big deal. And then there are several weeks a year where they're not allowed to recruit at all, have no communication with recruits, which I think is big at all. First of all, from the no bowl ban perspective, let me start by saying this. I like it a lot. And I like it a lot because this is what you guys and girls have told me you've wanted in terms of NCA punishment for years. And I tend to agree is that what you what you want is you don't want the current players and the current coaches who had nothing to do with the violations at hand being punished for things that they had no control over. At this point, I, I would venture to guess there's barely a handful of players in the Tennessee program who were even recruited by Jeremy Pruitt, let alone played for him. And those kids shouldn't be punished. They shouldn't be punished with a bowl ban. They should be allowed to go to the postseason. Obviously, if they're good enough to qualify for the college football playoff, they should be allowed to do that. So I like that. I like it a lot. I should mention, by the way, the $8 million fine. Like, I know it's 2023 and we got, you know, tens of millions of dollars rolling in with TV money. But that's not an insubstantial amount, especially when you factor in all of the legal fees that it took to fight the NCAA, fight Jeremy Pruitt, all that stuff. Now, again, part of it was obviously to avoid paying Jeremy Pruitt a $13 million buyout. But $8 million ain't chump change, okay? Um, And I do think this is something I've actually thought about for a while. Like, I remember going back years. I mean, I'm talking a decade, probably back when people actually cared about punishing schools for violating NCAA rules. And I said, don't don't give out bowl bans. Don't give out postseason bans. Find the find the athletic department. Take away their money. Hit their wallet. That's how it's that's how you're going to impact change. And that's what I think happened here. I'd add a couple more things. One, as I said a minute ago. I don't think the punish. I don't think Tennessee got off light on the punishment. That's been a lot of reaction from a lot of non-Tennessee fans. Oh, they got off light. They got off easy. Not getting a postseason ban is not getting off easy. As I said, twenty-eight scholarships over the course of five years is not insubstantial. 
That's five fewer players a year, six fewer players a year, every recruiting class for several years. You know how much that's going to impact the depth chart, the depth of the team. We all know how college football seasons work. We all know how football seasons work in general. If you listen to this show, you love football, whether it's professional or college. I guess it's college, but still, if not both. Depth, attrition, injuries, guys don't work out, guys get thrown off the team. Stuff happens over the course of the college football season, and you need dudes. You need bodies. Tennessee's going to have fewer bodies than their opponents. The recruiting stuff, again, is not insubstantial. I bring it up. They have to limit recruiting communication. They can't reach out to recruits a couple weeks a year. That includes in December and January which is peak portal season. Everybody's competing for the same players, and there's going to be times where Alabama can call a guy, Georgia can call a guy, uh, Clemson can call a guy, Kentucky can call a guy, whoever Tennessee's recruiting against can call a guy, and Tennessee can't. Like, don't tell me that these are insubstantial things. They're not. But finally, what I would also say is that I, I do think that the punishment, in my opinion, is fair. I don't think they got off easy. Last thing I would say is I had a few people say, you know, this is kind of a, a not insubstantial punishment. So there, there were some people that thought, OK, they got off too easy. There's others that are like, it's not insubstantial. And the question becomes, and I had a few people ask me this, is the NCA back in the enforcement game? Like, is this proof that the NCA is going to stand up and say, you break the rules, we're coming after you? That I don't believe. I think this was a unique case because it happened in the pre-NIL era. But the one thing I keep hearing again and again from coaches and administrators publicly, by the way, not this isn't like a I got on the phone with so and so and they told me this, but I can't share their name or who they are. No, like schools are basically saying whatever the NIL laws in our state are, we're going to abide by them. We don't care what the NCA says. If you remember a few weeks ago, the NCA made a statement about, you know, uh, if if your state law conflicts with NCA rules, schools are expected to play by the NCA rules, even if it even if it's in in line with your state law. Remember what Ross Bjork, Texas A&M AD, said. Was asked about this, and he said, "You know what he said? He goes, we're abiding by the state law." Next question, and, and just dismissed it as if no, whatever the state law says is what Texas A&M is going to do. And so you don't think that's the same at Texas, at Alabama, Georgia, Tennessee, whoever. So I don't think this is some indictment that the NCA is back, baby. They're handing out punishments left and right. Fascinating story, interesting story. The good news, I would I would add, of course, it goes without saying. Tennessee's in great shape under uh, uh, Josh Heupel. Really excited about this program. I don't, you know, but but I don't think they got off easy. I think Josh Heupel will figure it out because he's a smart guy and a good coach, but I don't think they got off easy.